JJ, and I'm Anielis. African Americans have been making history in Rochester for a very long time. They have made many important contributions to the city. But history is just not about the past. That's right, JJ. Even today, many African Americans continue to make history. So let's see some history makers. Rochester has a rich and varied past that is alive with stories of notable African American citizens who made contributions to our city. Some of these notable citizens include Austin Stewart was a runaway slave who came to Rochester in 1816 and opened his own meat market on what is now West Main Street. Frederick Douglass, a former slave, abolitionist, orator, and publisher, made his home in Rochester from 1847 to 1872. Activist Hester C. Jeffrey came to Rochester in 1891 and founded a number of local African American women's clubs, including the Susan B. Anthony Club. Isabella Dorsey incorporated the Dorsey Home for Dependent Colored Children in 1917. The city's first African American architect, Thomas Boyd Jr., was the chief architect for the Monroe Community Home and Infirmary and contributed to the design of the Rundle Memorial Library. In 1931, Beatrice Amaza Howard became the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Rochester. Howard Coles was a noted historian, journalist, activist, and expert on the writings of Frederick Douglass. And finally, Dr. Freddie Thomas was a scientist, inventor, biologist, and scholar. He is known for his pioneering research in genetics and plastic surgery at the University of Rochester. These were just a few of the African Americans who made history in Rochester. with Mayor Lovely Warren in her office at City Hall. Mayor Warren is the 67th Mayor of Rochester. She is the first female mayor of the city, the city's second African-American mayor, and if that wasn't enough, at 37, the youngest person ever elected to that post. Mayor Warren, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this, Katie. I really am excited about it. How did the incident where your grandfather was injured when he was a security guard inspire you to become an attorney? When I was seven years old um, at number two school located here, number four school located here in the city, um, my aunt told us that my grandfather had been injured um, while working as a security guard at Wegmans. And when I learned of this incident, um, I you know, I was talking to my family about it and I said, what would happen to the person that was actually, uh, that actually shot my grandfather? And they told me that the person would be prosecuted and that they would be um, tried in a, you know, in front of a jury of their peers. And um, they talked about um, the prosecutor and I always thought that um, and wanted to be an attorney because of that incident and I wanted to make sure that people were held accountable for the crimes that they committed. What motivated you to become involved in politics? When I was a student at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in Manhattan, I had the opportunity to do a, a internship in the New York State Assembly. 
I, as I stated before, I always thought that I would probably be a prosecutor. But I, by doing that internship, I had an opportunity to actually see the law in a different uh, sort of way. Um, that you could actually make laws and write laws and research um, the laws that people used in the courtroom. And so um, because of that, I decided to practice and study government and political science. I was able to work under the professional tutelage of Assemblyman David Gant, uh, who was the first African American elected to state office from the city of Rochester. And from that, um, I decided to go into um, to politics, mainly because um, I returned to the city as a young professional. I saw that many of my peers was leaving the city of Rochester because they didn't think that they had a voice and I wanted to be a part of the change I wanted to see in the world. What would you like to accomplish while you are the mayor of the city of Rochester? As the mayor of the city of Rochester, I would like to ensure that our children have access to a quality education, that our residents have access to good paying jobs, and that our streets and our neighborhoods are safer. I have a four-year-old daughter who's growing up in this city and I want this city to be as good to her as it was to me, and that she would see this city as a place where she could raise her family. What advice would you give to young people, especially girls, if they were interested in becoming involved in politics? Stay away from boys, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, the advice that I would give to young people, especially young ladies that are growing up in our community, is to believe in yourself, that you can accomplish your dreams. I was born and raised in this city. I love this city. But most of all, when uh, challenges presented itself to me, I believed that I could accomplish whatever I set out to do. And I want you to believe that no matter what, you have everything within you to achieve the dreams that you want to achieve. So let nothing and no one stand in your way. Thank you so much again, Mayor Warren. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> Mayor Lovely Ann Warren continuing to make history. Hi, I'm Miriam. Today I'll be talking to Mr. Van White. Mr. White, a lawyer, has worked hard at stopping and preventing crime in the city. First, as Mayor Johnson's Special Counsel on Crime and Violence Prevention, then as a member of the city of the city the school district board. Currently he is president of the school board. Mr. White, why did you decide to become a lawyer? Well, um, for me it was quite simple. I was born in 1962 and when I was born and shortly after I became a toddler and then a young child, I observed the struggles that we were having in America in terms of civil rights and some of the people that were fixing that were lawyers. There was a lawyer by the name of Thurgood Marshall uh, who was really responsible for making sure that schools were accessible and available to all people without regard to what your color of skin was or how much money you had or didn't have. And so I was really impressed and wanted to do what Thurgood Marshall and other lawyers did to set things right in the courtroom. And so I decided probably when I was about 11 years old that I wanted to be part of a system that could make America better. I'd seen people who were not lawyers like Martin Luther King and, and Bobby Kennedy uh, do things that uh, made America live up to its promise. What is your interest in education? After I became a lawyer, that one of the best places to make America better was in schools. And um, I realized, even in my work in the courtroom, that uh, the best place to make um, schools better was in the boardroom. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, Rochester, New York State, many states throughout the country, have boards of education that are responsible for making sure that students have books and good teachers. Boards of education make schools better. And so I decided to run for school board. But I also recognized that people outside of that area, the practice of law, were also responsible for making uh, America better. And included in that were teachers and principals and custodians and cafeteria people who serve folks food. 
Um, because if America has any chance of fulfilling Dr. King's dream, I really believe, and I know there may be people who disagree with me, I really believe that it begins here at schools. Why do you start the Center for the Study of Civil and Human Rights? I started it because I felt, in addition to making a difference in the courtroom and in the boardroom, that there was yet still another place where I could make a difference, believe it or not. I felt that um, some occasions uh, school wasn't the appropriate place or wasn't always the best place to offer um, education in terms of our past. Uh, schools have certain things that they have to accomplish during the course of the day and they of course can't dedicate a whole day to instruction on civil and human rights. That topic, as you can imagine, is very dear and near to my heart. I would spend a whole day talking about civil and human rights, but I realize teachers can't do that in this building and they are responsible for teaching a lot of different subjects. So I wanted to create something where uh, it would be dedicated exclusively to the study of civil and human rights, uh, where people could come and get books just on civil and human rights of violations, just on how America has made good on its promise of civil rights and sometimes has not done so well. I wanted to have a place where uh, students and adults could come learn about the richness of America's history in terms of its struggle to improve itself in terms of how we treat people, whether you're African American, Asian, whether you're a woman, Japanese, a, a, a Native American. Um, and so the Center for the Study of Civil and Human Rights gives people, adults and children alike, an opportunity to study those things. And they can literally come to the center, which is located in downtown Rochester at 18 Grove Place, and it doesn't cost them a dime. Now listen, I got one other thing to tell you. When I realized that it was sometimes difficult for students to get to the center, the downtown uh, uh, Rochester, New York, I bought a bus, a 37-foot bus. It's the exact same make and model bus that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. It's called the GMC TDH Transit Bus, built in 1951. I had it totally restored, had it painted to look just like Rosa Parks' bus. I installed drop-down DVD screens, an audio system where you can hear Rosa Parks talk about why she actually refused to give up her seat. I call that bus my Civil Rights Museum on Wheels. So when students can't get to the Center for the Study of Human Rights, Civil and Human Rights, we can take the bus to them. I would invite you all at number nine school and schools from throughout the county to come and see that bus. And in fact, we took the bus to Washington, D.C. on the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. I create these opportunities so that, again, America can become better and so that Dr. King's dream can become a reality. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Van White, working hard to stop violence and continuing to make history. <laughs> I'm here with Dr. David Anderson, also known as in Kofo when he is performing. He is an author and a storyteller. He is also a founding member of the Bl Black Storytelling League and of Aquaba, a group of living history presenters. In addition, he is also a visiting community scholar at Nazareth College of Rochester. Dr. Anderson, you are an author and a storyteller of ancient African folklore and African-American history. What has drawn you to these topics? It's a matter of identity. I was born as an uh, African-American and in un order to understand what the term means and also how rich I am, it is necessary for me to try to get into the history of the cultures that probably my forebears, my ancestors came from. Tell us about your work with Aquaba. Aquaba, the Heritage Associates, as we also call ourselves, is a small number of uh, people, some former teachers, who are interested in trying to deliver to uh, students and to visitors to Rochester 
an accurate and a positive history of how African Americans have been a part of the development of the nation since it was 13 colonies. A Co-op of the Heritage Associates is uh, frequently uh, called to work with uh, classes in various schools all over the county, but especially city school district. Again, in, in giving reenactments that help in understanding the history of the African American in this community. We focus a lot on the Underground Railroad, which, uh, of which Rochester was a major uh, stop and a, a distrib distribution point for people coming from south on their way to uh, Canada. Dr. Anderson, why do you feel it is important for people to remember their heritage? The more people know about their heritage, especially African American people, the higher can be the expectations of how we will present ourselves, what we will strive to do, and how we can uh, help this community to uh, become better than it is and also help the nation to be as good as it can be. So by knowing one's own heritage, you can select those properties which are positive and good and try to create a, a way of people understanding the value of what you do and who you are. Would you have said Kofa share a story with us? Yes. Perfect. Okay, glad Please stop. Rochester started out as a village. It, in fact, it was called Rochesterville, named for one of the three men who bought the uh, land around the Genesee River that eventually became the city of Rochester. But before it actually got into being, there was a, an incident that occurred in Bath, New York, about 75 miles south of here. There, Captain William Helm, a slaveholder from Virginia, had settled with some of his slaves, one of whom was Austin, Austin Stewart. And Austin was hired out every day. He would go work for somebody here, there, and yonder. But always the money for his labor went into Captain Helm's pocket. Austin was eager to be free. But there was no way he could see. But he kept the idea in his head of becoming free. In fact, while cleaning out the village church, which he was made to do every Sunday, although he couldn't worship there, he found the scrap of a book stuffed in a hole in the back room to keep the air from coming in. And he held on to that book. And every night, by the light of the fire, he would try to figure out what the little markings meant. He also observed that people coming to the town of Bath, maybe going to the livery stable, he noticed there was a sign over it and he copied that in his head. And he, he noticed that people were going to the post office to get letters. And so he, he saw that sign and he copied that down on the notebook of his mind. And he was using everything he could to try to understand what was in this little scrap of a book. And you know what? As the seasons rolled on, it began to make a little bit of sense to him. And in fact, I think it was in March of that year when he was sent to the sugar bush, you know, where you take the maple syrup or maple sap that comes from the trees and you pour that sap into a kettle and the fire is under the kettle and boils the sap and boils it and eventually you get maple syrup. And so while one day he's waiting for the, the for the for the, 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 the sap to come to a boil, he's looking at his book and and sure enough, he's beginning to notice that some words are understandable. And as he's looking at it, he fails to hear Mr. Fitzhugh, the son-in-law of Captain Helm, the one who owned Austin. And Mr. Fitzhugh crept up on Austin and grabbed the little book and threw it into the fire. And then with his whip, he began to lash and lash Austin, and lash Austin, and say, if ever I catch you in a book again, I will rip every inch of skin from your body. And then 
Mr. Fitzhugh went away to rest himself as Austin lay there with the blood flowing out of his open wounds, he smiled and said, oh yes, I will learn to read if my life is but spared. And his life was spared. And in 1817, after he had escaped, he decided to settle in the village on the west bank of the Genesee River. It was called Rochesterville. And the following year, since he had become known to some of the positive thinking people in the village, he crossed the river to the east bank of the Genesee River. And if you go there today to the hotel that is on that property, and you go to the second floor, you will find a memorial to Austin Stewart, who said, after a severe beating, if my life is but spared, I will learn to read. Amen. Ashe. Dr. David Anderson, author, storyteller, and a living history presenter. Keeping African American history alive in Rochester. Hello, my name is Anielis, and I am here with Mr. Carvin Eisen. Mr. Eisen is a man of many talents. He is the creative director of the independent film production company Image Word Sound, the general manager at RCTV Studios and an associate professor at the College of Brockport, SUNY. Also since 1978, he has been the videographer for Garth Fagan Dance. Mr. Eisen, you are a very busy man. However, today we are going to focus on you as a director of films, which shine a light on historical events. Most people know me for socially engaging documentaries about historical events. Uh, July 64, for example, was the first film to uh, look at the causes and the effects of the so-called riots of 1964. It was the first time someone put in a motion sequence the reasons that it happened and exactly what did happen. And so we are very uh, happy about that, very proud that we were able to pull that off. Uh, another film that I made uh, relatively recently is Shadows of the Lynching Tree. It's about a very difficult historical subject in America, and it's the first time that anyone, any film in America, tried to look at the realities of lynching uh, in America. So. We, we work on a lot of historical films that deal with history, but we try to bring them to current, make them current, so that they have a connection and then people can see how we got here from there. What is the message or lesson you hope your films teach? There are two things that I really hope that they do. One is that they're faithful to the issues that they're focusing on. The second thing that I'm interested in is being faithful and true to the technology that I'm using, that I, fr like you guys are doing, that I frame my shots well, that my audio is clear, that the editing is precise and engaging uh, people to look at it rather than just uh, ignoring those kinds of concerns and not paying attention to that. Are you working on any films now? Number one, we're working on a film, a documentary film called July 14, which is an attempt to look at our community 50 years after the so-called riots of 64. And the way we're doing it is we're working with two sets of youth, one from the city school uh, 58 World of Inquiry and one from the Harley School, which is in Pittsburgh. And we're bringing those two sets of students together to learn about each other, to make 
media about each other and to look at the issues that uh, they inherit, if you will, from the public policy decisions that were created as a result of July 64, 50 years ago. Another film that we're doing, that I'm working on, is um, uh, a project on quilting. You'll never believe that. Quilting. You know what a quilt is? Yeah. All right. Well, um, a quilting artist contacted me to do a film about quilting. And I said, why would, why would I do a film about quilting? I don't, I don't do films about quilting. And come to find out that I do do films about quilting, or I'm going to, because it's incredibly exciting what they did. And this film, this quilting issue uh, for African Americans, fits perfectly into your African American history exploration, because what these quilts are are really living documents about uh, information and how information would be uh, communicated to people who couldn't use newspapers and who were prevented from engaging in their traditional means of communication. So they would weave messages into their quilts to tell people where to go, where the Underground Railroad was, and who to contact, and all sorts of things. And they're just extraordinary wall sculptures that are colorful and, and dynamic and interesting. Thank you so much, Mr. Eisen. And thank you, Anya Lise. You are wonderful. You are very well prepared. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of your films in the future. Carvin Eisen, a filmmaker producing films from an African-American perspective who continues to reveal and make history. I am here today with Janet Lomax. She is an award-winning news anchor at News 10 NBC. With more than 30 years experience in broadcast journalism, Ms. Lomax was the first African American in Rochester to anchor the weeknight news. Mrs. Lomax, tell us what it was like being the first African American nightly news anchor in Rochester. It was indeed an honor. But you know, I didn't know that at the time. It was pointed out to me by the publishers of About Time magazine, James and Carolyn Blount. That magazine chronicles African American history in Rochester. At the time that I was named co-anchor of the 6 and 11 o'clock newscasts here at News 10 NBC, I was simply focused on doing the very best job that I could do as a journalist. And I've been here now 35 years and I thank the community for that. I understand your mother had a saying, except, adjust, and advance. Can you tell us what that means to you? I love that saying by my mother, accept, adjust, and advance. And to me it means this, in life there are going to be ups and downs, there are going to be hills and valleys as we pursue our goals. And I think what my mother means is, in life, remember this, they're going to take you, there are things that are going to take you in different directions, perhaps directions in which you had not planned. But as long as you accept what you cannot change, that doesn't mean you don't try to change it, but if you can't, you accept what you cannot change, you adjust to that, and you advance, you continue on toward your goals. It has helped me tremendously. What advice would you give to students interested in going into journalism? Some of the advice that I would give to students who are interested in journalism uh, revolves around reading. I love to read. And when I was growing up, my mother took my two sisters and me to the library to get our library cards. And that's one of the best gifts she ever gave me, the love of reading. So my suggestion is this, read as much as you can. It doesn't have to be the newspaper every day. It could be your favorite book, or it could be on some subject that you're interested in. Another thing that I would suggest is that you do exactly what you're doing right now. Here you are producing a documentary, and you're in elementary school. You're learning how to run cameras. You're learning how to do interviews. You're learning how to talk one-on-one -on -one with another person. You're asking questions, and that's the most important thing that you can do. It is to ask questions. Never be afraid to ask 
a question. Thank you, Ms. Lomax. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the students who are taking part in this documentary. Thank you to school number nine for taking on this project. I think this is tremendous. Janet Lomax, for over 30 years, a local news anchor continuing to make history. Wow, but there's more, right? Of course, there's Ursula Burns. Wait, wait, don't tell them. Let's show them. African Americans made hi history once again in Rochester when William A. Johnson Jr. was elected mayor in 1993 with 72% of the vote. He served as mayor for three terms. I, William A. Johnson Jr., do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear. I have a brother older and sister younger. My mother was extremely poor. We grew up in a very poor neighborhood, horrible neighborhood, and we lived in a horrible building. I mean, all of the stuff, we lived in a ghetto. And my mother told me early in, our li in my life, and my brother and my sister as well, that where we were was not who we were. She couldn't change the circumstances. She couldn't change where we were living. But she could invest a disproportionate amount of her energy and her resources towards our education, towards my education and my brother's and my sister's education. So she did. One of the things that we are falling behind, uh, behind in the United States is our ability to produce science, scientists, technicians, engineers, and mathematicians. These people solve problems, they create wealth, they make business. We are moving away from, well, we have years ago, started moving away from this as a, as a laudable, uh, proud area. I became an engineer by accident. Why isn't there a way to, why don't we prime kids to, to be ready for this earlier? And I spend a lot of time on that with the president. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a critical issue, a critical issue, a critical area. Garth Bagan, founder and artistic director of the award-winning and internationally acclaimed Garth Bagan Dance, has revolutionized oh, modern dance. Community and stage, dancing, people, human beings dancing, as opposed to dancers portraying human beings. For his groundbreaking choreography for The Lion King, Fagan won the Tony Award for Best Choreography in 1998. The costumes and the puppets in Lion King offered a challenge for me. Um, at first when I saw them, I started to get very nervous. And then I said, well, wait a minute, chill. You've never done this before. Why not see it as a way to grow? But we still need to see the future. Let's meet some future history makers. I want to make history by being a police officer. I want to I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a dentist when I grow up. Me too. I want to be a kindergarten teacher. I like working with little kids. I want to be a lawyer. A nurse. I want to go into a field of architecture and become an architect. I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a veterinarian. I'm going to be in the army and fight for freedom. I want to keep the streets safe when I grow up. I want to go to LA and just build the tallest skyscrapers that I could possibly go on. I like fighting crime and stuff like that. Like I, I'm very interested in that field, I guess. I'm going to make history. I'm going to make history. <laughs> and I'm going to make history. I'm going to make history. <laughs> I'm going to make history. We're going to make history. I'm going to make history. History. It's a story. It sure is. But it's a story that never ends. It just continues. On and on and on. You get the picture. Will you be a part of it?
Thank you.